like to introduce our first speaker, um, Katie Hind. Uh, Katie is uh, just an amazing role model, I think, to meet all of us new investigators in the field. Katie does fascinating research on non-human primates, looking at the evolutionary perspective of um, lactation and human milk, or milk. Um, she was telling me yesterday about her institute and, and our focus on evolutionary medicine. Amazing. Um, she's also a huge presence on social media around uh, science communication. It's almost Marshmallow Madness. Um, if you've not heard of Marshmallow Madness, look that up when you get home. Um, it's an awesome online tournament that engages people around the world, including students in um, science communication. She does so many things, um, and I'm so, so excited to have her here. Um, I was about to say something that it might give away one of your bingo card tricks. So there's a very special square on that bingo card that I think only applies to Katie. So um, you'll have to figure that out for yourself. But welcome, Katie. We're so glad to have you. Thank you so much, Megan and Nathan, for having me. This is um, fantastic to be here. I've never been to Winnipeg or Manitoba. Um, and have actually spent very little time north of the wall living in Arizona as I do. And so this is quite a treat. Thank you for organizing our afternoon activities. And bringing together such an amazing group of people. I'm exceedingly enthusiastic about the multiplicative emergent effects of bringing disciplines together. Um, people that have extensively overlapping agendas, priorities, um, and vision uh, to kind of talk about the different ways that we move our fields forward. Uh, to improve human health. So thank you for making this all possible. I want to begin with my disclosures. Uh, all of my research that I conduct is funded by the institutions at which I've been faculty or by um, uh, like the National Institutes of Health, the National Science Foundation, big public trusts of taxpayer dollars. And beyond that, I, I think it's important to acknowledge that all of my academic training was also done at public institutions. So in, in every way that I think about my scholarship and the ways in which I have developed my expertise, um, it's really something that's part of the public trust. And part of that mandate is that I speak about my expertise to diverse sets of stakeholders that are approaching infant nutrition and infant health from different, different ways. Now, I, I don't know if you noticed, but I didn't begin with a title slide, um, in part because I really um, I'm using the fact that we're at a workshop and we're really here to grapple with complexities to really drive home my takeaway message um, that has emerged from two decades of research on mother's milk. And that is um, a fundamental construct of evolutionary biology, which is that everything is about trade-offs in so many ways. Right? So real estate is location, location, location. Evolutionary biology, it's trade-offs, trade-offs, trade-offs. And what this means is that there are particular biological imperatives that every organism has to solve. And they have to solve them with constrained resources, right? So whether we're talking about energy or time or skeletal calcium, whatever it is that is used to underlie physiological and behavioral processes is limited. And it has to be allocated toward maintenance, growth and development, and reproduction and all the elements within those. And when we think about reproduction specifically among adult mammal females, we see that hundreds of millions of years of evolution within what led to the mammalian lineage has shaped physiological adaptations for allocating resources across different priorities. So when we talk about reproductive ecology in mammals, we think about trade-offs. So mothers have to make a trade-off between the number and condition of their babies. Right? So you can think about litter size in rodents right, at a species level. Or for people that work in human clinical practice, you can think about twins versus singletons. Right? On average, twins are going to be smaller than singletons, even though the fetal placental unit altogether in a twin pregnancy is much bigger. Right? There are trade-offs between maternal condition and reproduction. Right? So a calorie spent on fetal development during pregnancy or milk production during lactation is energy that flows away from the mother. It's not going into her own maintenance, her own development if she's young, or her own um, somatic insurance, which is a really nice term for chubbiness. <laughs> <laughs> and, and so we see this in mothers that have very closely uh, spaced pregnancies, that you have this cumulative maternal depletion that compromises their health, their condition, and can even put them at 
risk of mortality. And so natural selection has shaped female mammals to when there is a limitation to make a trade-off between themselves and this particular reproductive event to conserve themselves for future reproductive potential. Related to that, most mammal females initiate their reproductive career before they attain full adult stature. Okay? And this is true for humans as well. Right? You have uh, maximal skeletal density in your mid-20s. Um, you don't finish gaining height until your early 20s. And yet we know that 16% of pregnancies worldwide among humans every year is among teenage mothers. So this is where there's initiation of reproduction when a, a mother is herself still growing, still developing. And just like I can only spend a dollar once, I can burn a calorie once. And it can either go to the reproductive compartment or, or the individual development of that female. And all of this is not happening in a single uh, reproductive event, in the vacuum of a single reproductive event. And this is where we have, I think, a major disconnect between evolutionary biology and our messaging about breastfeeding and infant development. And that's because natural selection has shaped organisms not to optimize the outcome of any one pregnancy or one infant or one reproductive event, but rather the physiology of an evolved organism is shaped by the production of offspring across an entire reproductive career. This is, I think, one of the hardest things for people to understand because we culturally, as humans, think about how much we pour love and affection and resources and care into each one of our precious babies. But the physiological adaptations that are operating from our evolved history are going to be making different non-conscious trade-offs. This is why we see risks of preterm births. We see mothers in very marginal conditions having poor pregnancy outcomes, poor infant growth and development. All of this is about trade-offs. So that's the mom. But from the infant's perspective, they also have developmental priorities. But their limited resources are constrained by the milk a mother produces. So those milk calories, those milk minerals, those milk immunofactors, that they rely on to steer their maintenance and development is going to be constrained by that which is constraining the mother. And I want to spend a few slides kind of talking about the area of research that I work on, trying to understand the kinds of cumulative outputs as a function of these trade-offs. And today my talk is really going to focus on the young mother. Because right? every mother has her first baby. Not all women go on to have multiple babies, but every mother is going to be a primipara. Right? She may not be a multipara. And the primiparous pregnancy and lactation is very exceptional in many ways. So um, many people that might be um, familiar with my research know that I do a lion's share of my work in rhesus macaque monkeys, because I'm really interested in, in primates, of which humans are one. But our cultural practices and um, our food ecologies and our mother-in-laws and all sorts of aspects of the human condition shape investment in lactation. And I really want to get down to like that primate evolved physiology. And so I work with captive research um, primates that live outdoors in California. These are animals that get ample food, balanced nutrition, and daily medical care. Um, so they are really having a very, very buffered and supported experience such that when we see constraints in their milk production, it's telling us something really important about even when conditions are at their best, mothers are still facing trade-offs. And we know that many, many, many human mothers are not navigating in any way the best of what, what they deserve. So just some real quick highlights of um, the research I'm really excited about right now that's tying together um, a lot of threads of my research over the years is how primiparous monkey mothers have compromised milk synthesis. Full stop. Okay. So they're going to be making uh, lower milk volume. They're going to be making uh, lower fat and protein content in their milk. And when we put these things together, um, this is not just a function of the fact that they're smaller, that there's local impediments within the mammary gland in their ability to synthesize milk for the young primiparous mother. 
When we put the energy density with the volume together, what we see is that throughout lactation, the primiparous rhesus macaque mother is producing significantly less milk. Now, rhesus macaques, just like humans, have different ages at which they have their first infant. They can be three, four, or five years old um, in their natural fertility population. And this is the equivalent of a 12-year-old, a 16-year-old, and a 19, 20-year-old human mother. And what we see is that the very young, and in the natural fertility population, the very old primipara are both compromised in their milk synthesis. So what we see is that, um, I'd really like to draw your attention to the first gray bar in each of these. This is our three-year-old mothers that have the earliest reproductive debut. They make less milk of lower energy density such that they are particularly compromised in their ability to make calories for their babies. Okay. The mothers that are delayed in their reproduction from what is typical for this species also show global deficits. Now, we also know that the calf moms on their first pregnancy make significantly diluter milk for their daughters. And so we're seeing interactions between maternal parity and whether or not they're rearing a son or a daughter. These data come from um, 300 subjects. Okay, so now we found there's these deficits in primiferous mothers and their ability to synthesize milk and how they're able to allocate it between sons and daughters. What happens when their daughters grow up? Well. The daughters of primiferous mothers have significantly um, compromised growth throughout development. So when they initiate their reproductive career themselves as primipara or as multipara, they weigh less and they have shorter stature. So that underinvestment in their first thousand days, it's much shorter if they're monkeys, but in their first thousand days, underinvestment leaves a signature across their lifespan. And when they have um, milk synthesis, they are compromised in their ability to synthesize milk. So having been reared by a primiparous mother impacts the milk of her, uh, her daughter. And then for the last piece of this is that the babies of daughters of primiparous mothers grow differently. Okay, so this is our third generation. And what we see is not that they are stunted in their growth but that there is a tighter correlation between their growth and the milk that they're getting. Now, we're in the process of further analyzing these data, but what we think, and we have other data to substantiate, is that the constrained milk that they're getting from their mother, they have to prioritize toward the compartment of growth. Because babies face trade-offs between their growth and their cognition and their behavioral development. So these babies, with less resources are showing that they are prioritizing their growth so that they can reach a certain threshold to survive. These are the layers across generations of mother's milk synthesis. And we can see the echo of trade-offs of past generations as well as the signatures of the constraints in the present generation. This means that in extreme contexts, adapt adaptation shaped by millions of years may function to protect maternal survival, condition, development, and future reproduction at the cost of the present infant. And the capacity of the marginal, constrained, and challenged mother's mammary gland is going to hit ceilings on their milk production that is below what is optimal for that infant comprehensive integrative development. So for me, one of the biggest challenges and imperatives that we have as a breastfeeding and lactation world is to move past discussions of, there we go, of the, you know, less than, no, oh, that was way past, of the less than, you know, 5% of mothers in high income countries are recognized as having lactation failure. This is an extreme circumstance, but milk production has a normal distribution, right? And we need to have better tools and talking points to talk about the context under which mothers are underproducing. And we need to do that because this is a space that makes mothers vulnerable to aggressive marketing campaigns, 
This is a space that has significant impact on mother's psychological well-being, their perceptions of their inability to seemingly meet the needs of their babies is something that we know weighs very, very heavily on mothers, and yet we aren't talking to them about the many myriad ways that they actually have no power over what their mammary glands are doing. And we need to have clinicians that can better recognize and manage what is shiftable, what is supportable, what is increasable, and what needs interventions so that mothers are taken care of and babies can sustain optimal development. Thank you. Uh, and so our third and final speaker for this panel is uh, Lisa Zicolo from Bristol University. Um, Lisa studies the genetics of intergenerational uh, uh, disease and development. I met Louisa last year when I uh, was fortunate to spend some time on sabbatical in Bristol. Um, and so she's doing lots of interesting projects around genetics and development, uh, one of them focused on breastfeeding. Um, and so I'm excited to hear a little bit about how that's going. Uh, welcome, Louisa. Thank you very much to Megan and Nathan for inviting me today. Really excited to be here. Um, my main disclaimer when I was putting together my talk was that I felt a bit like a fool, to be honest, because I haven't got a breastfeeding paper or a lactation or human milk composition paper published in my name yet. So I thought, what am I to contribute? But obviously, I have done research before, and I have used and developed techniques to better understand the causal aspects of early um, exposure in development. And so I thought, what a bring is expertise to the field and the, the start of a collaborative of a big collaboration to study the genetics of breastfeeding. So I hope I can convince some of you and uh, have many fruitful conversations about pros and cons of doing this. So first of all, um, I was thinking, I was asked to think about why we would want, um, why I do the research that I do. So what's my research question and why I'm doing it. And the main research question I have is, are we sure that the claims attached to the long-term long effects of breastfeeding for mum and for the offspring all stack up to be real? Um, as you know, m much of the evidence comes from observational studies, and in epidemiology, we keep mm, on the mantra that association does not mean causation, and uh, much of the observational studies that come out with claims or effect estimates for long-term effects of breastfeeding are done in um, high-income countries, where breastfeeding is, as you all know, very cultural and socially patterned. And so if we observe that educate, if we observe that moms that breastfeed for longer have more and better educated children, uh, how, do we, how are we sure that what, what we are seeing is the effect of longer duration of breastfeeding and not the effect of the breastfeeder, also the mom, and the environment in which the baby is being raised? Now, this is just one particular example that I find easy to get my head around, um, but obviously there's uh, many other outcomes, long-term outcomes that we can apply this to. So I really think that it's time to use uh, all of the uh, other study designs that epidemiologists and public health specialists have uh, developed to try and uh, attack the, the claims from all different angles to see which ones actually survive the attacks and which ones um, come up. As, as having consistent results from different study designs that have different assumptions and different biases. So the reason why I want to study the genetics of breastfeeding is because I would like to have what we call genetic causal anchors to compare babies and moms that breastfeed for longer to those that breastfeed for shorter duration. So the idea is that because we have that triangle that I, men I mentioned earlier, that the triangle of confounding, of what would make us say we shouldn't be fooled by association until we can prove its cause of. Um, the problem with just asking moms in a, a high income country setting how long you rest before and then comparing their children in terms of the outcomes is that we, we may try to um, keep everything as as, pos as equal as possible, almost mimicking a randomized control trial, we're not always successful in doing that. But if we could find a, a variable, in particular a genetic variant, Z, that was a proxy or a predictor of breastfeeding duration and was purely genetic, so in theory not associated with any of the other confounders, then we would have created a pseudo-randomized experiment 
by using genetics. So this is also known as medieval randomization, and it's an analytical approach that has been used uh, and very much in my group in particular, by the group that I come from in particular in Bristol, but also in many other uh, research groups in epidemiology in the world, applied <coughs> to DOHA and productive um, outcomes, but also to other common complex diseases. And the idea is that if we had uh, the gold standard research, which would be a randomized control trial of longer or shorter breastfeeding duration, whether exclusive or any breastfeeding, um, that would be ideal for comparing um, long-term effects in the offspring. But we don't have that. So to mimic that, given that it's unethical, feasible, um, really expensive, um, difficult to fund, so in, in the absence of that, what we can do is use already existing <coughs> observational data and genetic data, and we can, instead of separating moms and babies according to um, randomization in, in different tri um, trial arm, is compare them by genetic predisposition of the mom or the baby to breastfeed for longer. And in doing so, all of the other characteristics of the family and the mom and the baby should be balanced, just like they would be in an RCT. Now, I'll just give you a couple of examples of research questions that I feel particularly strongly we should be tackling first. And some of them involve maternal health and some of them involve offspring health. And I think something that would really help also shift uh, um, the opinion and mobilize commissioning services for improved support for breastfeeding would be to um, ultimately prove and quantify the extent to which breastfeeding duration, improved breastfeeding duration helps with educational attainment and quality development in the babies. So it's the question that I mentioned before. Um, and I would like to do this in a bi-directional way so that we can study with the approach that I just outlined in the organization, we can study the direction of association between is maternal education really causally a determinant of breastfeeding duration, but also the other way around, is breastfeeding duration a causal determinant of offspring education, taking into account genetic and environmental compounding. But then from a maternal point of view, a really interesting question is that um, I feel strongly about is looking at mood disorders and uh, uh, internalizing disorders for mothers. So here I, I write depression, but I also mean to look at anxiety. And we know that anxious and depressed moms antenatally struggle to breastfeed for longer and to achieve successful establishment of breastfeeding. But then we also know that early cessation of breastfeeding is a risk factor for postnatal anxiety and depression. And so it would be really um, optimal to have better understanding of which directional effect um, is, is at play here. Now, what I'm really excited about is trying to find genetic predictors of breastfeeding duration for mom and baby. Now, when I came up with the idea of we need to improve, improve the design of studies looking into the long-term effects of, um, of breastfeeding and use Mendelian randomization, because that's what I do all the time, and in particular in relation to alcohol as exposure, I could not believe that there hadn't been a genome-wide association study done on breastfeeding ever never, or uh, early cessation, uh, exclusivity in proliferous women, or any um, offspring. It's just never been done. The data is out there. There are so many cohort studies in the world that have genotyped and assay um, the data for uh, genome-wide uh, association, genome-wide variation, and so many of them have collected either prospectively or retrospectively some sort of breastfeeding information. And yet, and for example, all the ones that looked at birth weight have done it, but the published extensive in birth of the gestational age, nobody done it for breastfeeding. So I thought, hey, this is an opportunity to actually look at the genetic determinants of breastfeeding duration and using both the maternal genes, but also the offspring genes, because there could be physiological and anatomical effects driving, you know, for example, the inability to latch uh, or the sucking behavior from that point of view. Now, it would be interesting to do it by ethnic group, and also, I think, 
uh, it would be particularly interesting to study populations in which we know breastfeeding rates are very high, because that would constitute an enrichment for the genetic determinant of breastfeeding. So if you think about the population where people don't have to breastfeed very much, and if you try to look at the genetic determinant of breastfeeding in that population, you're likely to find uh, um, determinants that might, determine, that might actually proxy for their education or their body mass index or their score for depression. So, but not so much physiologically and specifically meaningful um, determinants of, of breast injuration. But in populations where breastfeeding rates are very high, the only people that do not breastfeed or that they breastfeed for shorter might be doing so because of actual physiological um, impairments or biological trade-offs. So fortunate, we are fortunate enough to be um, able to put together, put together the results from studies conducted in different parts of the world where breastfeeding rates vary. And here the arrow points at three geographical regions. Um, included in our preliminary study, we have two cohorts from the UK, from England, uh, one of the lowest breastfeeding rates in the world. Um, two very large cohorts from Norway, the highest breastfeeding rates in the world, and uh, in, in, in the high in countries, and uh, the cohorts from uh, South Brazil, Pelotas, with intermediate breastfeeding rates. But a very interesting fact that breastfeeding duration and any breastfeeding in that area of Brazil is not associated with socioeconomic status or education. So this is just to recap the number of participants that we have in the phase one, which it was. Um, unfortunately, because of um, delays with data access and ethics committees, I'm not able to present the preliminary results to you today, uh, but we're hoping to get those in the spring and for this to inform uh, the snowboarding of the consortium and continuous recruitment of more cohorts to be part of the consortium. So the next big breakthroughs in, in my field, in establishment of the cause of long-term effects of breastfeeding, I really think are in the direction of being more inventive and exploiting different study designs. And when I say that, I think that what's important is to not just hold up one study design as the holy grail, but it's important to identify what are the biases that, and the assumptions behind each study design and how and in what direction if any, they could be affecting your estimates and then bringing them all together. And so if the effects are all consistent between each other, then we believe that more. So that um, has been um, proposed you know, this, this qualitative comparison has been proposed as a triangulation. And uh, one of the uh, ways in which we can do that for um, my research topic is to use cohorts in different parts of the world where we know that breastfeeding is associated in different ways with the main confounding factors. And here we have a graph that shows from a paper published now seven years ago how in uh, the uh, lighter gray, shade of gray in the study, um, the cohort study uh, work written in the past, but in Bristol, um, increased duration of breast, uh, breastfeeding is associated with increased uh, socioeconomic uh, status, whereas in the Brazilian cohort that I mentioned, isn't. The, the association is flat. And so um, I expect you might not be able to read that, but when we look at the, the um, long-term effects in terms of cardiovascular risk factors and IQ in the children for the two different studies. Um, it's interesting that for the cardiovascular risk factors, blood pressure and BMI, what we find is actually, um, for BMI in particular, we find the almost the opposite directions of effect, and we conclude that there's no strong evidence either way. Whereas for IQ, we find the similar, consistent direction of effect. And that's yet stronger evidence that really breastfeeding um, as, as a whole is affecting um, positive IQ. Now the next big things um, in, in the microbiological field that I think would be better causal estimates of breastfeeding behavior, and in particular being able to disassociate the breastfeeding behavior as a whole from various ways of supplying human milk to the baby, um, whether it's on the milk or pumping, 
um, versus the actual components of breast milk. Um, in particular, in relation to components of breast milk, we have a, a sub-study, uh, we have the next generation study from the cohort study ASPA for the children of the children of the 90s, whereby we're now recruiting um, prospectively all the newborns from the third generation in the study, uh, a bit like your monkey study, by the humans, and they're now at the age of 27, and so out of about 14,500 of them originally in the cohort, about 600 have had a baby. Some of them have had more than one. Um, and so, and all of them have been recruited into the cohort, and the recruitment continues with various logistical challenges. But in, in, as part of that, we've been collecting breast milk. And so, even though the numbers are quite small for now, um, it's time, I think, to apply for funding to start uh, looking into the components of breast milk for this cohort too because we have data on their grandmas in pregnancy, which is amazing. Okay. So I think the main challenges of my research um, I can see in three, three different um, categories. The first one is a practical type of challenge, and it's about collecting, because the sample sizes are really key in a genetic uh, genome representation studies, to be able to collect enough um, individuals in the samples and enough enough cohorts collaborating together um, to data harmonize between the different ways in which breastfeeding information has been collected and funding. But also there are political um, challenges in that it is impossible to do this type of research in a single cohort. You have to have hundreds of thousands of individuals to have some meaningful estimates. And so, so team size is politics. politics. And uh, the third challenge is ethical, and uh, even just discussing with a few of you over the next, the last 12 hours, I realized that what comes to me as second nature, which is finding genetic proxies for environmental or modifiable determinants, isn't quite straightforward when it comes to breastfeeding duration, because what if this becomes ammunition for feeding board? What if it's being embraced by formula feeding companies, saying, oh, we can screen you for your inability to supply enough milk to your baby, because you might have the genetic proxy for being able to breastfeed for less time. And so I really think that a lot of thinking needs to be done before even getting the results into what we want to do with the results and why are we getting the results in the first place. And uh, in particular, what type of communication do we want to have with the public about the results of, for example, a genome association study of breastfeeding duration. We're not doing it for stratified medicine or personalized medicine. We're doing it to get better understanding about the causal aspect of longer breastfeeding duration universally for everyone. So totally BFI compliant. And I think this is really important when it comes to the type of study that I do, because it isn't the genetics so that we can separate people, but it is the genetics so that we can unify people. And the challenges to the field that I think, you know, we should preaching to you because you've thought about this much more than I have, but I think getting the messages straight is really important. And so, for example, emphasizing claims of, pharmacy, of uh, formula companies is wrong, but it's also wrong to emphasize claims from the other side, from our side, if you want. And uh, when I had my first baby and I was already an epidemiologist, the midwife gave me a leaflet with 20 health benefits, long-term health benefits of breastfeeding for mom and baby. And then she asked me which one was more important to me, and I said, the only real one, education and condition for the baby. <laughs> the other one, I don't believe are true. We don't know about it yet. And it, it's wishful thinking, and it just d does everybody a disservice to exaggerate claims in other way. Um, so that's why I think this is important. But there is little or no randomized data, so let's get in with the people who are doing uh, RCTs of uh, breastfeeding uh, promotion, because it might be that we can actually nest the mechanistic and causal studies within those RCTs. But those are really hard to get funded, so in the meantime, let's do other study design. Um, yeah, and there is class funding for any, any one of these studies and for data, so um, I will also be interested in developing active and passive digital data capture, in particular around smartphones, for um, better and quicker and cheaper collection of Thank you very much. Shameless flash for our conference in uh, New York.
the speakers, so we can come back. Um, and then uh, Katie and Daniel will come up to the front for questions. Um, so I'll open it to the floor as they walk up here. Are we, are we standing or are we sitting? Uh, we can sit. It's hard to see them. Maybe that's nice. Start with this. And then she and Raphael. Yes, thank you very much for an amazing interdisciplinary panel to launch this, this workshop. So my first question uh, goes to Luisa, and I wanted to get a better sense of the type of genomic traits that you are after with regards to trying to explain different degrees of success among women across populations. And secondly, <clears throat> isn't it at the end of the day epigenetics here what we should be paying attention to? with regards to how the environmental factors related to stress, related to nutrition and so on, shape or tag the, the, the genome and ultimately determine the breastfeeding outcomes. Okay, so I think I'll answer your second question first because it's easier. Um, so is it epigenetics that shapes the breastfeeding? second questions and your answer to that, uh, since we're talking about challenges and solutions, there might actually be a way that you can get information on epigenome and transcriptome by taking human milk samples. So the technology exists, and that is a potential solution to actually look into that and not just stick into it at the genomic level, but go a few steps further and look at epigenomic and, and transcriptomic levels. Thank you. 
Mr. Simmons round variables also, so I'm going to tag on. Sorry, like the causal link here, so I'm going to tag on as well. Like I think as we're thinking about what would make a really good instrument or a really good causal anchor is like making sure that that connection between SES and our and our instrument variable doesn't exist. Because as I'm thinking about, I can imagine mechanisms where SES would actually impact the expression of genes or the expression of human milk that might then and open up that backdoor path and create um, a confounding relationship connecting our instrument, which now is no longer an instrument, with the outcome. But well, I, it I, wouldn't like, impact the germline like DNA, though. It, okay. Because so, that's immutable. Okay, so would, like it, would it express, would it impact how it expresses? Maybe, because okay. it's expression. That was a great talk. Um, so my understanding of MR and um, using the genetic risk score as an anchor is that uh, you'd have a biological um, biomarker that would link the instrument or the risk score to the outcome. And I've never seen that done with a behavior. Yeah. Okay. So that's, yeah. when so a that's behavior the, is so environmentally determined. So I would say, I would say you know, to keep you short for people who are not interested in this, um, you know, I, that, that was the beginning of MR, so that was the uh, original, that's where the original idea came from, and here in South Africa, everybody can understand, um, there is, um, you probably all know that some uh, East Asian um, individuals have uh, almost an intolerance to drinking alcohol, to metabolize alcohol, and so uh, that's due to a single uh, nucleotide polymorphism, and so you actually have this amazing uh, instrument, you can look at people of East Asian origin who can drink and not
now it's much, much, much easier. C corporations are keeping up, um, catching up with that. So it is more expensive, but there's two hands-free, wire-free pumps. So this is LV and um, Willow. So I think for even, I think of pilots, police officers, teachers, um, pumping will be a lot easier. Already is. I'm looking to continue. I will say though, yeah, yeah they're five hundred dollars. Those are not options that are covered by health insurance companies. Either. Right, but I mean, the, if the technology is it there, is giving, then if we push those prices down, it can be more accessible. So, I think we'll continue to see that. Can I just follow up to it? And like, and this is this is one of the things that I didn't mention that I think is really important to understand about the insurance industry and how it's
know, like comfort nursing and these kind of long tails that you see or um, species typical lactation patterns. So this is something that I was worried about. Yeah, you can see it, you can see the daily measure of teeth. Um, but like when we look at human populations, we know that in traditional societies, standardizing that just to find out what's normal so we can mimic it in the infant formula product. Um, 
So I think to have that data to show that there's a huge variation, it varies globally, it varies by location, it varies over the course of lactation, it varies depending on the infant, by genetics, whatever it is. Showing that variation and that that variation is normal, I think is very important. Uh, and that concern that we're trying to identify milk composition so we can mimic it, I hear it. But I think coming with that answer that the variation is important, uh, I think it's going to be key to the field. Yeah. I think that's very important. So I'll be the last one to say. Um, because, yes, there's um, sometimes we get the, as someone who does both milk science composition and breastfeeding research, I'll sometimes get the comment that, well, why would you even study milk composition if not to make better formula? So you must really need supporting formula. When, no, that's not the only purpose to study milk composition, right? And you're right. I mean, 